All right. Good evening, and welcome to BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, provided here by New Covenant College, taught at the Institute here at the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. We come now to our 14th lecture in this class, and we're going to now look at an overview of the poetical books. We've already looked at the first two sections of the Old Testament, beginning with the Pentateuch and then with the historical books. And we come now to the third of the four sections, which is the poetical books. Now, this is perhaps the most difficult section of the Old Testament to overview because of the nature of the literature that makes up these books. Unlike the Pentateuch uh, and the historical books, which are largely written as a straightforward narrative, as the name implies here, the poetical books are written in a form that is poetic. It's a poetic form, and it's, it's a little different uh, than a narrative. And so we need to understand, if you remember that important class we had where we talked about different genres require different forms of interpretation, when you come to poetry, you need to be able to interpret it differently. right? So um, there are some disagreements over which specific books are to be considered in this section. Most Bible scholars affirm, however, that the poetical books are composed of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Sometimes you'll see the book of Lamentations thrown in with the poetical books. I don't think that's wrong or right. It's just a different uh, way of looking at it. But for this class, we're going to consider the book of Lamentations when we study the prophetical books, not the poetical books. Uh, again, other portions of Scripture contain poetry. There's poetry in, in all sorts of different books. Uh, but these books have a distinct name, poetical books, because they are characterized. The nature of the whole book is poetry. It's not just like Genesis, right, where you have a 50 chapters that's almost entirely historical narrative, and you might have a poem thrown in, or the book of Judges, where you have a uh, historical narrative, but then you have the song of Deborah, I believe it was there, which is poetry or, or lyric, right? Uh, we still would interpret those books as narrative, but these, these books, the poetical books, are poetry in essence. So in order to overview them, we need to understand some things about poetry. We need to talk a little bit about the unique features of poetic literature. And if we're going to comprehend the message behind the poetical books, we need to be familiar with the common literary devices that are found in poetic literature. Now, unlike English poetry which relies much on sound, right? Uh, probably the most distinct feature of English poetry is rhyme. Uh, although we do have English poetry that doesn't use rhyme, but that's, uh, there's sound and mnemonic devices that are key to English poetry, whether it be alliteration or onomatopoeia or rhyme. Hebrew poetry is, is very different, though. Hebrew poetry relies on the components of thought and structure. Uh, I think that's actually kind of a little interesting tidbit. The fact that Hebrew poetry doesn't rely on sound makes it very easy to translate it into other languages without losing the poetic nature of the language. And that's just an interesting little thought there on the preservation and translation of Scripture, the fact that the Hebrew language, which is what the poetical books were given in, uh, the, the structure of that poetry is able to be translated into other languages. And we could probably spend several classes just talking about literary devices and the nuances of poetry, but we're just going to consider two primary literary devices tonight. Um, the first is parallelism, and the second is uh, figures of speech. And uh, we'll look at some examples of those. So again, the first is parallelism. This is a very important one. Um, there's five different types that we're going to consider, five different types of parallelism that we're going to consider. The first is synonymous parallelism. Well, let's, let's give a, a, just a basic definition of parallelism. A, a, as you can picture the idea there, you know what parallel lines are, two things that run side by side. So 
uh, parallelism is a, a literary device that uses two things that are going congruently or side by side or in companion with one another. And so there's five types we're going to look at. The first is synonymous parallelism. Synonymous. Synonymous. Uh, synonymous parallelism is when the second line, when the second line repeats the idea of the first by using a synonymous word or phrase. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 49. Turn to Psalm 49. Psalm 49, and look at verse number 1 of Psalm 49. Psalm 49, verse 1 says this. Hear this, all ye people. That's the first line. Second line, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. Do you see the synonymous parallelism? Hear this, right? Uh, and then the second line, give ear. Same thing, just two different ways of putting it. All ye people and all ye inhabitants of the world. Two different ways of putting the same thing. So that's synonymous parallelism. Uh, we'll look at an another one that's opposite of that, and that's antithetical parallelism or antithetic parallelism. Antithetic. And you can probably... Uh, guess what this kind of parallelism is. If, if it's not synonymous, it's antithetic. So this is when the second line states the opposite or contrasts or contradicts the first line. When it states the opposite, contrasts or contradicts the first line. Flip over to Proverbs 15 and verse 1. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. Proverbs 15 and verse 1 says this. A soft answer turneth away wrath. And by the way, the book of Proverbs is filled with antithetic parallelism. So uh, you need to understand that to get the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Here's the key word in antithetic parallelism. But grievous words stir up anger. So you see how that second line is, is a contradiction of the first line. Soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words words stir up anger. Third kind of parallelism, emblematic parallelism, emblematic parallelism. Now, emblematic parallelism is when one line explains another with the use of a picture, a symbol, or an analogy. Uh, when it explains another with a symbol, picture, or an analogy. Flip over to Psalm 42. Uh, have you turned to several places this evening. Psalm 42. And look at verse 1. Very uh, well-known verse. There's, a, I believe, a spiritual song written in the theme of this verse. Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks. There's a picture, right? So um, panteth my soul after thee, O God. There's actually uh, several literary devices in that one verse. We'll look at it in a minute, but you see the picture there. The psalmist is using this picture of a, of a thirsty deer panting after water uh, to describe his own thirst and hunger for God in his soul. So that is what we would call emblematic parallelism, and it's in poetry. We have two lines. One is a picture. One is the explanation. Um, so then we have climactic parallelism, or sometimes called staircase parallelism, but climactic. Climactic parallelism. Uh, turn to Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. Climactic parallelism is when each line builds upon the thought of the preceding in a way that kind of staircases the effect. So it starts here, and it, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the thought is progressing. Look at Psalm 29 and verses 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. So you see how it's building upon. Each line is building and building. So, And then the last kind of parallelism is synthetic parallelism. Synthetic. Synthetic. And this is when uh, two lines 
express one complete thought. So two lines form part of one complete thought. So you need both lines to make sense of it. Turn back to Proverbs 15, if you will. And Proverbs 15, look at verse 16 of Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord. Okay, so right there, that's an incomplete thought. Better than what? Right? So you need that second line to explain it. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. So that's, again, another prominent parallelism that we find in the book of Proverbs. But you see there uh, that it is uh, two lines that are expressing this one thought. So those are five types of parallelisms. There's more, but you need to understand them. And then as you're reading, make a note of it when you see it. Uh, maybe a, a fun exercise for you to do to familiarize yourself with these would be to read through Psalms and Proverbs and have you a little note sheet next to you. And every time you run across some of these parallelisms, just jot it down. Just jot Proverbs 15, 16, dash synthetic parallelism. And then uh, once you're done reading through Psalms and Proverbs and the other poetical books, you'll be able to review that and you'll see just how much these uh, devices are used. Now I want to talk a little bit about figures of speech. So that's parallelism. Let's look at figures of speech. And the first that we'll consider is a simile. A simile. Um, you hear in this word, simile, the, 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 the word there, symbol, where we get our word similar from, or uh, to, to have something in common, right? And it, as a simile is a comparison between a topic and a symbol, which often uses the word like or as. So it, it uses a, a topic or a, a de declarative statement and then a picture, and then you'll, you'll see the word like or as. So when you see those two words, think simile. And again, remember I said Psalm 42 and verse 1 has uh, many uh, or, or multiple literary devices. Well, it also has a simile in it. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, right? So there's the, the simile there. He's comparing the two. The second we want to consider is a metaphor, a metaphor. And uh, really, a simile is a type of metaphor. A metaphor is a figurative comparison, a symbolic comparison stated didactically. So it's not stated with like or as, it's just uh, stated as one, as one declarative statement. Uh, for instance, the Lord is my shield. Well, the Lord is not literally uh, a piece of metal that we put on our arm and carry into battle, but the Lord protects his people and defends his people. And in that sense, metaphorically, he is our shield, right? So that's a metaphor, and the Bible's stocked full with them. Uh, the other two we want to look at is a metonymy and a synecdoche. Metonymy and synecdoche, and I'll write these up here. Uh, metonymy. And synecdoche. Uh, let's see, where's that D in that word? Yes, that's right. Synecdoche. Metonymy and synecdoche. Uh, these are both, um, they're similar, but they're different. They're figures of speech where you see the substitution of one word for another based on a commonality between them or a representation of a part for the whole. Okay, so a, a metonymy is uh, when you substitute one word for something else because there's a similarity there in the picture. For instance, in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 40, the Bible says that there was death in the pot. Death in the pot. Well, death is an abstract noun. You, you can't put death in a pot, but there was something poisonous in the pot that would cause death. Right, so that's a that's a metonymy, and we use that in everyday language, don't do we not? Right, um, when we say there's there's evil in in that place, you know, well there's not evil in that place, but there are things in there that are that are evil, right? Uh, and a synecdoche is when you use the part of something to represent the whole, like when the psalmist says, "My lips shall praise thee," right? Well, 
not just his lips, his whole, his whole person is praising God. He's praising him in his thoughts and his actions, right? But he says, my lips, to symbolize uh, that he will praise him with, with the words that he uses. It would be silly to say, well, are your vocal cords not also going to praise God? No, of course not. But, but that's what we mean when we use a synecdoche. So uh, the third, or no, the, the fifth, excuse me, it's a Bible class, not a math class, is personification. And personification is when you ascribe uh, human attributes to an inanimate object. Uh, so Psalm 114 in verse 3, the Bible says, The sea saw it and fled. The sea saw it and fled. Well, an ocean cannot see anything. An ocean is an inanimate object, does not have eyes, right? But uh, it's describing or it's attributing human characteristics to this uh, inanimate object, right? And we get that that's a figurative language. And then the last one is anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, um, you language scholars will recognize the word anthropos and we understand that there is something to do with man in this word and uh, it is in, the, in theology when you talk about anthropomorphism you're talking about the ascribing of human attributes to God. And not in any kind of sinful way, but God does this actually in his own revealing of himself. He will oftentimes anthropomorphize himself and explain himself uh, with human attributes so that we can understand him. Right, right. If he, if he exclusively spoke of himself in his dimension, we would never be able to comprehend him. So God will talk about his hand, the hand of the Lord, or the mind of the Lord, right? Or even uh, when we see in the Bible where it talks about God repenting. Well, God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He declares the end from the beginning. So it's not as if God thinks, well, I have this idea, and he doesn't know how it's going to turn out, and then he tries it, and it doesn't work. And so then he says, well, I guess that didn't work. I need to change my mind. God does not repent like you or I repent, but he explains uh, his changing of course depending on the actions of men in the terminology of repentance so that we can understand something of what he's doing. So those are some uh, literary devices, parallelism and figures of speech in the poetical books, and they're found really all throughout the Bible, but especially in the poetical books. So let's look now at the theological and biblical significance of the poetical books. Um, the Pentateuch deals with Israel's moral life. The historical books deal with Israel's development as a nation. The poetical books deal with Israel's spiritual life. And the prophetical books deal with Israel's future and the coming of the Messiah. So when we talk about the poetical books, we're talking about the spiritual life of the Old Testament people of God, Israel. And when we're reading these books, we learn about God and about spiritual realities through the eyes of these Old Testament saints. We get to see what they thought about worshiping God, what they thought about uh, what their, their, their heart affections toward Jehovah. These books reveal Israel's aspiration for the coming of Christ. And we find many vivid pictures of Christ painted in these poetical books that are fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay, So, um, this is how we're going to divide up the poetical books for our present study. We're going to divide them up into three different categories of poetry. And the first category is lyric poetry. Lyric poetry. And this would encompass the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms. Now, you know that the book of Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. It is composed of 150 psalms. Originally, it was written as a five-volume piece, right, that was broken down into five different books. And it was broken down that way because of the length of it. They were, remember, they were written on scrolls. And perhaps in your Bible, if you have a Bible that has subheadings or chapter divisions, chapter headings, um, you will see where it might say book one, book two, book three, book four, book five, right? So um, understand that it's all one piece, 
but it, was, it had to be written differently, kind of like how we had 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. That was just written as the book of Samuel, or 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It was just kings, but it was divided because of its length. Uh, Psalms was the hymn book of Israel, and it was intended to be sung. Right? It was the hymn book of Israel, and it was intended to be sung. And in the New Testament, in Colossians and Ephesians, New Testament Christians are commanded to sing psalms as a part of their corporate worship. So it's really the hymn book for Old Testament Israel, but it's still involved in the Christian worship today in the New Testament. Now, here's just some pet peeves of mine. Uh, When pronouncing and referencing the book of Psalms, you need to remember that you're referencing a hymn book. Therefore, you don't say, turn to Psalms 23. No, it's Psalm 23, or the 23rd Psalm. Just like you wouldn't get up with a hymnal and say, turn to hymns 57, right? You say, turn to hymn 57. And also, we need to understand, too, that uh, the Psalms are not chapters, right? It's not Psalm chapter such and such. It's just Psalm such and such. Uh, It's not written like, for instance, a Pauline epistle was written, and then it was later divided as chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, because he's... Uh, He's flowing with one continuous thought from beginning to end, right? The Psalms don't necessarily have that same flow in them. They're written at different times. You might read one Psalm that that was written by David during his life, and then the very next Psalm might be written by someone else in a completely different context in a completely different setting. So the same continuity between the Psalms is not there like it is in narrative, okay? Okay. The Psalms, as we just mentioned, have numerous authors, but the most prolific is King David, of course, the sweet psalmist of Israel, as he was called. Many of the Psalms refer to events in the life of David. So when you're studying the book of Psalms, you need to uh, understand and study the life of David, really, if you're going to get a lot of that, because he has Psalms that he writes when he's running from Absalom or when he's running from Saul or he has his penitent psalms after he sinned right against um, against God and against Uriah with his sin with Bathsheba he has psalms of his restoration so you need to understand the life of David when we study the book of Psalms but also you know Solomon was a prolific psalmist Uh, the sons of Korah um, were involved in the writing and the composing of the music for the psalms so that is uh Uh, important to to understand the context. You need to pay attention to not only the author, but also the setting and the type of psalm. We don't have time in our class, unfortunately, to break down all the different types. You need to understand the Christological psalms and the penitent psalms and the psalms of praise. Something that will really help you with this is the superscription, which some of the psalms have above them. Uh, Before you get to verse 1, just look there. Sometimes it's printed in a smaller print, but it, it really was in the original Hebrew. It was not something that was added by editors later. Uh, so it, it's, it's very helpful to understand a particular psalm if it has that. The psalms find a prominent place in the ministry of Christ as Jesus often quotes from them in his teachings. Jesus received the psalms as divine inspiration and authoritative. That's something interesting. Because oftentimes we think of the Psalms as kind of, um, yes, they're good for, for praise and they're good for singing, but there's no theology in the Psalms. No, that's far from true, far from true. And the Psalms, of course, provide us pictures of the Messiah, which Jesus fulfills in his life and ministry. Couldn't we not think of Psalm 22, for instance, where Jesus quoted on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you read verse or Psalm 22, and you just see this vivid picture of the Lord Jesus in his substitutionary death. So, first type of poetry is lyric poetry. The second is didactic poetry. Didactic poetry. And didactic poetry, or you, know, you could just look at it as straightforward teaching, uh, Didache, didactic, includes Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs was, of course, written by King Solomon. 
King Solomon was asked of the Lord, what do you want? And uh, he didn't say, I want wealth or wives or any of that, but he said, I want wisdom. Make me wise. And God answered his request, and Solomon was the uh, wisest man that lived, and he gave us this library, this anthology of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And what we learn from this book is uh, that it is possible to live wisely. We don't have to be foolish in the Christian life. All the wisdom needed to live a life pleasing unto God is available to God's people if they would but learn of it and implement it in their life. Proverbs is one of the most practical books in the whole Bible. You would do well to just read the book of Proverbs and apply it in every facet of your life. We like to quote these moral truisms and these maxims, um, and they're, they're fun to quote, but they don't do any good if all we do is quote them. You need to put these into practice in your life. And any man, I believe even an unregenerate man, will have an easier go of life if he would just read the 31 chapters of Proverbs and live, <laughs> live that way. Of course, you won't be able to live that way if you don't have the Spirit of God within you, enabling you to do so. Uh, but you, you see the, the point that I'm making here is just simply that God has given us this, this book where there's not too much fine interpret interpreting on our part that needs to be done. Just read it and apply it. Read it and apply it. Uh, and then Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is an interesting book. It's also written by King Solomon, and it demonstrates the futility of life apart from God. The key word in the book of Ecclesiastes is vanity. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Uh, the author, King Solomon, records the emptiness of his own experience to show us that nothing in this life will ever bring satisfaction if God is not the ultimate satisfier of the human heart. And Solomon had the money, he had the means, he was able to go out and try to please himself with whatever he wanted. He, with drink, with food, with raiment, with uh, trips and women and all these different things. And he said, at the end of the day, I realized it's all vain. It's all vain. So, Ecclesiastes. And then our last category of poetry is dramatic poetry. Dramatic poetry. And dramatic poetry, as again, as the name implies... It relies on the conveying of a story, conveying of a story to teach us a deeper truth or a, a, a deeper meaning. It uses dialogue to communicate a message. And this would include, of course, Job and Song of Solomon. Job and Song of Solomon. Job is perhaps the most distinct of the poetical books. Uh, it's arguably the oldest book in the Bible in terms of the date of its writing. So Job, many scholars believe, was the first book to be written. But it's not the oldest in terms of its contents. Obviously, you can't get any older than in the beginning as far as the contents of the book. But uh, the actual date of the writing, Job lived before Moses. He wrote before Moses, right? Uh, Job is dated somewhere uh, around the times of Abraham. Okay, somewhere around the time of Abraham, as far as when this story took place. And though it is poetry, Job was a real historical character. He was a real person. And uh, he experienced, as you know, great suffering. And the, the theme of the book of Job is Job's struggle with understanding why God allowed such horrendous things to happen to him. We, we have to read the book of Job. There's no two ways about it. You have to understand that all of those awful and terrible things that happened to Job did so by the ordinance of God. And when we study that, we wonder why would a loving God allow that to happen? But as you get to the end of, of Job, you understand that what we're being taught there is that God's wisdom is on a plane that is much higher and above man's wisdom. Job is saying, God, why is all this happening to me? And God says, Job, you don't even know how an ostrich works. <laughs> you don't even know how the world functions. Were you here when I put the stars in the sky? And Job is humbled. And he realizes that his sin was trying to vindicate himself rather than vindicating God. And that's what the book of Job does, is it vindicates the justice, the goodness, 
and the holiness of God in the midst of an evil world. Those who go out looking for some moral culpability with, uh, with God will find that they will be doubly condemned. You go out trying to uh, blame God and say that all of this evil is in the world because God is the author of it, you're only going to wind up condemning yourself. Then the last book of poetry that we want to consider tonight is the Song of Solomon. This was, again, also written by King Solomon. And sometimes you'll hear this book referred to as the Song of Songs, uh, or just Songs, or a, an older um, title for it, and some older commentaries will be Canticles. Canticles. Canticles is just an older English word for Psalms. And I'm just telling you this because as you're studying, if you're reading older commentaries, you might come across one of these words, and I don't want you to be confused and say, I didn't know that book was in the Bible. No, it's just another title for the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is a love story filled with metaphors and imagery. Metaphors and imagery. Uh, the central message of the book depends on one's perception of how it should be interpreted. Uh, and there's three main views of interpretation when we come to the Song of Solomon. One is that it is purely allegory. Uh, the characters are not real. The story is fictional. Uh, it, it is just a made-up, fictitious story uh, that, is in, that serves no real purpose other than teaching spiritual truths. Right? So it's, it's kind of like you take an idealist approach to the book of Song of Solomon. There's no specific correlation to real historical events. Um, the second view would be the strictly literal view. This view posits that the book should be seen exclusively as literal, and its purpose is to convey a historical event from the life of Solomon rather than teach a broader spiritual truth. Well, that view doesn't really jive with the poetical nature of the book. So it's best to understand uh, a literal typical view, so a, a, a view that... Uh, combines and, and harmonizes the literal aspect of the book and also the symbolic aspect of the book. And this is the view that posits that Song of Solomon does indeed record literal events that actually happened, but the purpose of these narratives is to teach spiritual truths through the symbols of the book. It teaches spiritual truths through the symbols of the book. This view recognizes truths in the Song of Solomon concerning God's design for love and marriage, and also Christ's love for the elect. Christ's love for the elect. This is the most common view of interpreting Song of Solomon, primarily with that Christological influence. Remember, we, we want to have a covenantal Christological hermeneutic, and so we need to see here in Song of Solomon these glorious truths of Christ's love for the people given unto him by the Father. So that concludes our study on the poetical books. Uh, they may be delivered in a different form than other portions of Scripture, but understand that they are no less inspired. Paul said all Scripture was given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? So these are profitable books, and they ought to be studied, they ought to be learned, and they ought to be preached from along with the rest of Scripture. I knew of one preacher that spent six years preaching a line-by-line -line series through the book of Psalms. Right. Um, oftentimes we think, well, expository preaching is just for the New Testament epistles. Well, not so. We should preach from even the poetical books. And these books present us with an insider's perspective of the hearts of those who love God. We can see the affections that God's people have for him. And it's very convicting at times. to, For instance, to read a Psalm of David when David is going through immense hardship and immense trouble and yet he writes of his great love for God. So, these books uh, are very important for our personal devotional lives as well and our private communion with God. So, those are just some practical blessings of the poetical books. That concludes our study, and we will pick up next time with the prophetical books. Thank you, and God bless.